happiness. Everyone is looking for it, but we look for it in all the wrong places. What if we had a guide that showed us what John Wesley called the complete art of happiness? We do. Join us this fall as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, one sermon that changed the world. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. I wonder if they sing that song at the church in plain view, Texas. <laughs> it reminds me, my uncle is named Stan, and his last name is Dean. And we used to love to get together and say, I bet every invitation song is Standing. Okay. Um, I have always loved movies where the storyline is people who just don't seem to be from around here. And no matter how you treat them, they seem to handle it fine because they're not from here and they know that they're going home. One of my favorites that comes to mind is the 1940s classic, um, Miracle on 34th Street. I know they redid it, but I'm telling you, the old black and white version is the best. And you have a, a man who is known around the area as the best Kris Kringle there ever was. And one of the reasons why he's such a great Kris Kringle is because he actually believes he is Kris Kringle. Can you imagine that, Tommy? I mean, he really thinks that. <laughs> and so Macy's hires him, and he is put there in the chair, and the line is out the door. Everybody wants to sit in his lap because he is the best Kris Kringle around. Now, of course... As people come to find out what he really thinks about himself, he ends up in a psychiatric ward. And they try to just bring him down. But he's got a special twinkle in his eye. And he's able to treat people so well and to change the way people around them view themselves because he's not from around here and he knows he's going home. A few years later, in 2001, they made a movie called K-Pax. And in that movie, the star says he's not a human, he's an alien from the planet K-Pax. And of course, he is in a psychiatric ward. But when all these astrophysicists come and they listen to him talk and lecture, he astounds them with his knowledge of the stars. And they try to beat him down and they try to hurt him, but he just seems to slough it off because he's not from around here and he knows he's going home. This section of the Sermon on the Mount we're going to talk about today, Matthew 5, verses 38 to 48, is perhaps the harshest, uh, excuse me, the hardest words the most difficult words coming from the lips of Jesus for us to understand and apply. If we've been reading the Sermon on the Mount up to this point, we probably have said to ourselves, especially if we've been reading with a checklist mindset, okay, let's see, I don't really have an anger management problem, check. I don't really lust that much, check. I've never cheated on my spouse, check. And I try to keep my word, check. And if that's the way we've been reading the sermon, Jesus turns it up a notch. No retaliation ever. If somebody tries to sue you, give them everything else you've got. Oh, and everybody's favorite, be perfect, just like God. It's helpful to remember, if this is the moment we all want to throw our hands up and say, I give up, it's helpful to remember 
that the Sermon on the Mount is not giving us new law. He's giving us fresh eyes. He's helping us see what God always intended behind everything he's ever said. And that is, I don't want you to just do something because it's the rule. I want you to be like me. And even more important, I want you to want to be like me. So much like the book of Proverbs, which says, here's what a wise person does effortlessly. The Sermon on the Mount really isn't a list of things where God says, I expect you to do it this way all the time, even when we don't like it because it's the new rule. He's not trying to break our backs on two commandments. He's trying to get us to see that a person whose desire has so changed, that they want what God wants, this is the kind of person, this is the effortless, natural, easy way of life for someone whose deepest desire is to simply think like Christ. This is the Sermon on the Mount. And so, Jesus gives us four real-life examples. But he starts by saying, I want you to know that you've heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Believe it or not, Jesus is actually quoting the Old Testament. This is Old Testament law. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And if that sounds harsh, you take my eye, I take your eye. Let's be generous to Moses and to the God who gave that rule in the first place. If you've ever seen a good Western, you'll know that without some rules in place, there is no limit to what might happen if you're able to retaliate against someone who took something from you. You steal my horse, I burn your entire ranch to the ground. And so as a way not to add to retaliation, but as a way to limit vengeance, the law said if somebody takes your eye, all you can take is their eye. It was a way to try to bring some civility to the world. And not just that, it wasn't supposed to be vigilante justice. It was supposed to be a court system that meets out to others, here's how we're going to do it. Take it to court, and the court will say, they took something of yours, you can take the same of theirs. It's punishment. And there may be many reasons for a court to impose punishment. You can think of some. Maybe because a good law that's put in place can serve as a deterrent, keep people from doing wrong again. Or maybe because if somebody's really hurt, this is a way of helping, uh, I guess, pay them back for what they've been taken. But in this case, the law we're talking about was really about honor. This was an honor-shame culture. And in this way, it makes perfect sense in that world. We still think this way. We say to be a man, you've got to protect yourself at all costs. I don't want you to hit anybody, son, the old story goes. But if you do hit them, hit them hard enough that they don't get back up again. And the truth is this. If you just take a look, take a look at this morning's headlines, you'll see that here's the truth. Violence breeds more violence. It's a never-ending cycle. Force is short-lived, and neither force nor violence has ever changed a heart. It was Gandhi who said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And so Jesus offers a radical alternative. Do not resist. Now, Jesus is not denying the law. He's not even denying the court system that allows such a law. He's telling his followers to take one extra step and don't use it. He's saying, don't practice vengeance. Don't retaliate. And why would we? This is about defending your honor in the kingdom of God 
there is only one honor to defend. He's the one on the throne, and it's not me. We are simple servants. We simply do that which is our duty to do. We are wretches saved by grace. Defending our honor may suggest too high a view of ourselves and too low a view of our God. For God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. God is the final arbiter of justice, and he will make all things right. Four real life examples Jesus wants to use. And so here's the first one he gives. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now on the surface, this is basically a slap in the face, pardon the pun, of our John Wayne mentality. If someone hits you, hit them harder. And it certainly is. But it's important to know what this slap is all about. In that culture, you would use your right hand hand. And so, to get it slapped on your right cheek means the back of your hand. Well, in that day, it was the same as it was in the 17th century, where you have these feudal lords, somebody's honor has been besmirched. You said something about somebody in my family, and so I'd go and I'd grab that that glove, and I'd slap you across the the cheek. It was a way of saying, you've hurt my honor, I want to hurt your honor. This is an honor-shame culture. If somebody slaps you on your right cheek, dares to challenge your honor, what do you do? You realize in that day, you could slap somebody of the same rank. You could slap somebody of a lower rank. You never slap somebody of a higher rank. Didn't do that and live to tell about it. You really have two options, retaliation or litigation. And Jesus provides this shocking alternative. Give him the opportunity to hit you again by offering your left cheek as well. God does not condone abuse. This is not a passage to be used to find some scriptural grounds for some abusive husband. Not at all. He's using hyperbole. But please live in the story world for a second to get the grave, deep, serious challenge Jesus is trying to give us. He's trying to say that if somebody dares to take your honor... Turning the other cheek is a way of saying, you are clearly wanting more than just my honor. Go ahead and do what you came here to do and expose the reality of the situation. A slap on the face is like a punch in the face. Trying to take my honor is treating me as less than human. That's what he's saying. Maybe turning the other cheek is a way of challenging the whole honor-shame culture. Maybe turning the other cheek is a way to announce that your pride and your reputation or even your life are not the most important things to you. It was Jesus who said, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In fact, he says it twice in the Gospel of Matthew. Paul said, we died with Christ in our baptism. And if we've renounced our lives... What honor do we have to defend? The kingdom, the kingdom of God is a whole different life. And we know that this new life is going to be fully experienced in the age to come, but it's supposed to be lived even now. And the kingdom of God is more important than our honor. Here's the second Real life example. If someone sues you and tries to take away your tunic, give him your cloak as well. You know, the poor will always have the mercy of the rich. And it turns out that if somebody needed money, you'd have to leave collateral at the bank. There were some people who only owned the clothes on their back, and that was two pieces of clothing. They had an inner garment. It was worn close over the skin. 
It was like a nightgown or their underwear. And then they had another garment. It was their outer garment. Think of it like a coat, which also doubled as a blanket at night if you lived out in the cold. There was a law. It was in the Old Testament. In order to treat people as human, but also to believe in justice, here was the law. If somebody wants to borrow money, they got to put up collateral. And so, if all you owned were two pieces of garment, you would put up your inner garment as your collateral. But if anybody charged an outer garment, that is, if they said, I want your coat as well, you're taking a blanket away from a man who has nothing. You weren't allowed to do that. And if they said, no, 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 take my outer garment, leave me naked, you are required to give them their outer garment back by the end of the day before sunset. It was the law. Here's what Jesus is saying. If somebody wants to sue you for 50% of what you have, literally the shirt off your back, give them your coat and your blanket as well. Think about this one. He's demanding that his followers give the one thing the law specifically protects us from having to give. How often do even Christians try to use the law to find ways to have and to keep everything they can? Here's what Jesus is saying. Imagine finding a way to be the kind of people who aren't thinking, how can I hold on to stuff? But rather, all that I have is yours. Do you know the kind of people who are so generous you say they would give you the shirt off their back? That's Jesus. And God's saying to his children, all that I have is yours. I want you to think about this. We do not live in scarcity. If God is my shepherd, what do I lack? If we see humanity as our brothers and sisters and we see God as the ever-supplying one, then what's our problem? Paul writes to these tunic takers and he says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 7, why don't you want to lose? When there's two Christians and they're fighting with each other, he says, why don't you just choose to be defrauded? Why wouldn't you take? I mean, why do you take instead of give? You're suing each other to see who's going to win. But in fact, when you're suing each other, everybody loses. And you know who gets defeated? Christ, the Lord of selfless love. The key point and takeaway is this. In the kingdom of God, the kingdom is about love and joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. And the kingdom is more important than our stuff. And if you are forced to go one mile, said Jesus, go two miles. Jesus uses some interesting words here, not Jewish words, but Roman words. It's the Romans who use the word mile. There was an actual rule at that time that if you're a Roman guard and your stuff is heavy and you want somebody to carry it for you, you can pick one of these people under your jurisdiction. You know, it's an occupied territory. And you can make any Jewish person carry all your heavy armor, but you can only make them carry it one mile. Now, some of you may say that when you were young, you were pretty devious. You do not have to be someone with a lifetime uh, achievement card from detention to understand how the Romans might have abused this one. One soldier would make this person carry their stuff one mile. And when they got to the one mile mark, another soldier would say, well, he made you carry it one mile. Now I want you to carry my stuff one mile. Sometimes they would make them do it on the Sabbath, which they knew violated their conscience and their understanding of work and their law of God. And in that culture, Jesus says, when somebody forces you to walk one mile, I want you to go the second mile. And I didn't hear any restrictions on what day of the week either, which may be a foreshadowing of a major sticking point a little bit later. 
Jesus says, offer to serve the one who is not asking, but forcing you to work and see it as service. Offer helpful service to the most offensive people you know. Do you realize what he's getting us to say about our things to people? Do you need more help from me? Remember, all that I have is yours. I have no need to protect myself. I have no need to demand my rights. The kingdom supplies all my needs. The key point and takeaway is this. The kingdom of God is about unending benevolence. Which means the kingdom is more important than your labor, your time, or even your rights. We may have to carry people's armor, but we don't have to carry a grudge. We're above it. Jesus' fourth example is this. Give to the one who begs from you and don't refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, it was a general rule in that day. Give only to kin and even then only give the minimum. The Old Testament law said that when you give to people in your town, just give whatever is sufficient for their need. I get that Jesus wants us to be giving people. But do you ever wonder how this fourth example fits in with the first three? Forcing you, suing you, hitting you, this is somebody begging. Well, imagine if someone asks you for a rake and you say no. And then the next day you need something from them, so you ask them for a shovel and they say no. You didn't give me a rake, I don't give you a shovel. That would be a case where lack of giving becomes a form of retaliation. So Jesus offers this radical alternative to bitterness and retaliation or even just supplying a need. Give with no limits. Give without worry to how sons and daughters of God are going to use this. I know that we live in the real world. We know people who abuse others. We know there are people with psychological problems where they don't know how to stop asking. Except that there's hyperbole in this story. But please, listen to the master's language and let it make us think. How does this idea of giving without limits make you feel? If our immediate reaction is fear or anger, we may need to stop and reflect why, for he's already taught us to put such things away. We have to ask, in what way can we possibly be taken advantage of? In the kingdom of God, our Father constantly supplies our needs more than we could possibly ask or imagine. We are the richest people on earth. The key point and takeaway is this. The kingdom of God is more important than your money. And when judgment comes, Matthew 25 says that the measure will be your deeds toward the poor, not how much you have kept in your pockets. It's hard to imagine someone who lives like that. And I want to tell you, if you're feeling that way, look at what Jesus says next. The whole chapter has been leading up to it. He's described the lifestyle of a person so full of God's spirit, so desirous of God's ways that the effortless action is one in which no anger, no lust, no dishonesty, no betrayal is even in their vocabulary. And then he says, not only is there no thirst for revenge or even a need for self-preservation, these people let love reign so supreme that they love their neighbor and they even love their enemy. Jesus gives us two ways to understand this. First, he says, when you love your neighbor, you're like God. God who gives rain on the just and the unjust. Okay, everybody understood that. Yes, yes. When I love my neighbor, I'm like God and it makes me look like God. That's true. And then he says, and when you love your neighbor the way you normally love your neighbor... It actually makes you look like a moral reprobate. 
You see, you're giving to the people who give to you. You're loving the people who already love you. You're hanging out with the people that are just like you. That's exactly what the Pharisees and the tax collectors and the prostitutes do. You're just like everybody else. God's call is for something different than everybody else. It means we need to see other people as if they are our brothers and sisters. This is a struggle for us, isn't it? We love our families. We take a loaf of bread to our neighbors that are kind enough to throw the ball back over the fence when Junior kicks it over there. We hang out with the church people who sit near our row and who always seem to smile and greet us when we walk inside. But who's going to love the worst neighbor on the block. It's helpful to remember that you and I were once enemies of God. We were cold-hearted, unloving. We were tax collectors and Gentiles, but it didn't matter to Jesus. He brought the bread of life to our door. And it's ironic. By seeing ourselves as tax-collecting moral reprobates, enemies, hanging out with enemies, then and only then can we begin to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. For all those in the room this morning who have felt the stinging end of abuse, please hear me. This is not a call to be a doormat. To love doesn't mean to feel warm, fuzzy feelings. It doesn't mean to give people what they want. It means to give people what they need. Giving illegal drugs to someone who asks for them is not a Christian thing to do. To let a thief keep on doing his thieving to all your neighbors is not loving your neighbors. We know that. What he's saying is we don't see them as our enemy. We see such people as our brother, as Joseph saw his brother's. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I have some questions. How are you going to react when the barista gets your order wrong for the third time in a row and never spells your name right? How will you react when the car cuts you off and everything in your body wants to give them a piece of your mind? Let's take it a step further. What will you do when your daughter comes home and tells you that she's being bullied at school and the teachers are doing nothing about it? What will you say when your coworker lies about you to your boss in an attempt to take your job and ruin your reputation and they succeed? How will you treat the umpire who's clearly and obviously calling balls and strikes for the other team? How about the landlord who never fixes the leaks but keeps raising the rent just because he can? What will you do when a classmate posts untrue and unflattering things about you on the internet? That's real life for us. And Jesus is challenging every natural instinct in our body. Let's turn it up a notch. What about the one who threatens you? rapes you. Or maybe worse, the one who does such things to the people we love the most. How do you love someone like that? Someone who seeks to harm you. Someone who who stands against your very existence. How do you love people like that? In 1996, the, the KKK was holding a rally near the University of Michigan. Hundreds came out to protest. And suddenly, in response, things turned violent. And one man, a card-carrying member of the KKK, with a Nazi SS tattoo, began to get savagely beaten. And that's when 18-year-old student Keisha Thomas made headlines. This teenage African-American protester used her own body as a human shield to protect, to protect the man from further injury. Two years later, Keisha was on Oprah. 
And Oprah was recounting the story. And Oprah asked, why did she do it? Wasn't she worried about her own life and safety? And Keisha thought about the question for a moment. And then she gave this very impressive response. If you're covered by God and you do what you're supposed to do, you don't worry about nothing else. It's like when you're a mama and your kids are in danger. You don't think about the danger. But this wasn't your kids, said Oprah. This was a guy at the KKK rally with a swastika on his arm. Yes, said Keisha. But he was also a fellow human being. Jesus is describing a new way of seeing where our objections to follow him go out the window. When Jesus tells us to take up our cross, he means we're called to be just like our master. Can I remind you, on the way to the cross, they slapped him. On the way to the cross, they took his clothes, his inner tunic and his outer tunic off of him. And they cast lots for him. They made him carry his cross a ways, and then they made Simon of Cyrene carry it the rest of the way. And on the cross, on the cross, he receives this begging. Remember me, the brigand, the thief, the liar. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' response in all of this was nothing but love. Father, forgive them and welcome him. And into your hands and yours alone, I commend the only thing I have left. He died between two enemies of the crown. And Jesus had nothing but love for them. Riding from a jail cell, MLK wrote the sermon, Love Your Enemies. And sitting on a cold slab behind bars, he wrote these words. Love is the only force capable of turning an enemy into a friend. And I think it's because as Jesus hung there on the cross and he looked at the people who were stripping him, depriving him, beating him, begging of him, he didn't see enemies. He saw friends in waiting. Imagine if that's the way we saw the world. If only the Lord would give us eyes to see. Imagine what a witness that would be. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been enriched. And if you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments, reach out to us at prayers at wschurch.net. God bless you. Tune in next week.